So yes, welcome to the section yes, of the environment. You there, Shannon? All right. Now you go. Okay. So welcome to the section on environmental compliance. So the reason this has become so important for NRCS is because how we've evolved it as, a, as an agency. Back when we were the Soil Conservation Service, nobody was too concerned with being in a defensible position concerning environmental matters. In fact, a lot of these and most all of these environmental laws were written after the establishment of the Soil Conservation Service. You know, we were more concerned with just solving erosion problems and helping our clients address their conservation needs. Not only that, but the vast majority of what we were doing was technical assist assistance with very little cost share involved with it. We weren't on anyone's radar and because everything we did was, you know, beneficial to the environment and generally unknown to the general public. You know, we basically dealt with our clients who were, you know, farmers, ranchers, et cetera. Therefore, environmental plan compliance wasn't that important and received very little attention. Today, you know, our program budgets are in excess of $3.9 billion. And, you know, you're in an era of government transparency. We have a much more diversified clientele. You get expanded cost share programs, and you got a lot of people very interested in how the government is spending the taxpayers' money. So it's important that NRCS pay closer attention to complying with environmental requirements and ensure that the agency conducts its business in both an economically and environmentally accountable fashion, because compliance with environmental requirements protects not only the agency, but also our clients from legal entanglements. So the topics we're gonna to be addressed today, I get the great joy of going over to legal framework and authorities for the special environmental concerns. We're gonna be looking at relevant resource concerns, NEPA triggers, you know, the environmental requirements, how environmental evaluation and planning are related to one another, and then we're briefly going to cover the CPA 52, but that's going to be in depth uh, more in the next uh, webinar. We'll be looking at the CPA 52 and CAT Xs especially, so that'd be categorical exclusions. So I get to do Civics 101. So the question is, who do you really work for? And I'd like somebody to, anyone in there to put it in the chat. Who are you working for? I mean, you're a member of the NRCS, you're a federal employee, you know. Anybody brave enough to enter into the chat? We have the public. The tax public? Payers. Taxpayers. State of Indiana Department of Ag. Well, I guess that'd be somebody who's a guest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have taxpayers, the state and Indiana Department of Agriculture, which doesn't really cover the federal employees. And the, the general public, which is really kind of a, a nice way of thinking about it. But again, back to Civics 101. The US government has three branches. You know, there's the legislative, which writes the laws, the judicial that interprets the laws, and the executive branch that executes the laws that are written by the legislature. So, in this sense, we are, at least the NRCS people on the, uh, the NRCS and FSA on the webinar, we work for the executive branch of the United States government because we don't write the laws and we're not interpreting the laws. So as a federal employee of the executive branch, you execute the laws passed by Congress. You know, you try to spend the taxpayers money wisely and provide service to our clients, but we are working for the executive branch. So our clients are, of course, the farmers, ranchers, timber producers, et cetera, who are our constituents. So in order for NRCS to do In order for us to execute our federal responsibility, we got to understand the framework. So environmental compliance deals with compliance with laws, regulations, policies, and agency guidance. Right now, what law allows you to disperse funds for EQIP? Any 
Anybody entering that into the chat? I mean, what is the law? Farm bill. It's the farm bill, right? So the farm bill was written by who? It's written by Congress. Once Congress passes the farm bill, can you disperse funds for equip at that moment when Congress passes that law? Anybody? Bueller? No, need regs. Say that again, Brian. Need, need regulation. Right. No, you can't. The law has been passed. But then there's the responsibility of the agency to write rules as to how you're going to implement that law. So laws are the basis for the rules. How do the rules become regulations? Does anybody know? So Congress passes the farm bill. The NRCS or the USDA writes rules for that. Why is there then a gap between when the USDA writes the rules and we can start dispersing money? What's going on? We have through public review it needs to go through public review. Yeah, and you're quite correct. It's through public review. It's through the. Uh, just lost it. The what? CFR. CFR. Code of yeah, the Code of Federal Regulations. So you, so the agency pub publishes the rules, and then there's a certain period in which people get to comment on the rules. Anyone can comment on the rules, at which point the agency is supposed to take the commentary under advice, you know, advisement, and then the regulation is published. And at that point, when you have a set of rules that have been re uh, reviewed within the Federal Register, and published, it becomes a regulation. At that point, as far as the agency is concerned, the regulation is no different from the law. Because if you're violating a regulation, it's just like violating a law. So we know the law is what's passed by Congress. The regulation are the rules set out by the agency as to how they're going to administer the law passed for Congress. Policy. Is there any legal basis to policy? Any answers? Policy is internal. Policy is internal to the agency. Essentially, it's not getting a public review. So that policy is then instructed to uh, Feel people through handbooks, instructions, and bulletins how policy is communicated to you know the field. But policy itself is internal. So it doesn't have the same status as regulation and doesn't have the same status as law. So the NRCS has a large amount of authorizing legislation. The Soil Conservation Act was one of the first. Does anybody remember what year the Soil Conservation Act was passed in? Don Donovan with 1935. Don Donovan is right with 1935. So as you can see, I mean, the legislation that authorized us as an agency far is 40 years older than the environmental policies or the Historic Preservation Act that were passed in the late 60s and early 70s. So this is again where we have to adapt to the laws that Congress passes. So the only authority the executive branch has besides what is laid out in the US Constitution is that which is passed by Congress in the form of statutory law. If it's not in law as a federal employee, you can't do it. So laws both authorize and limit federal action. You know, if you can't find it in law, you can't really do it as a federal employee. So the rules and regulations. Basically, the federal agencies write the rules in order to uh, service the, the law passed by Congress and explains how the agency is going to implement the law and its statutory duties. And at the point that it becomes is reviewed in the combined federal register and becomes a regulation, it's a basically the same as law to us.
which brings us to policy. So at the field level, you, you're following agency policy. You're not looking at the regulations specifically, and that's the internal guidance that the agency generates. That is that is based on the agency regulations, but there again is no public review of this. Policy is an internal document. So in general, uh, yeah, in general, this is what's in the general man, uh, manual. Policy does not have the force of effect of law and is trumped by regulation. Regulation, on the other hand, is trumped by law. So this is the situation, say, when EPA comes out with a regulation on the Clean Air Act and say the coal states, the attorney generals from the coal states sue. They're suing over the regulation. So when they bring suit against the regulation, that goes to a judge, a federal judge, who will then look at the law and see whether or not the regulation is following that law. And so this is what happens when you get those major lawsuits where you get eight attorney generals from, say, coal producing states that is suing for a published regulation by the EPA. This very seldom happens to us, uh, but not for a good reason. Uh, so if you depart from your agency's policy, that is a ground for what's called an arbitrary and capricious finding. Uh, and this is very different from a judge looking at the law and at the regulation. When a judge looks at the law and the regulation, that is usually a very long term process because the regulation has gone through the process that it was supposed to have done under the CFR. And you have a judge looking at the original law, trying to parse the parts of the original law and see whether or not that regulation uh, fulfills it or steps beyond it. Arbitrary and capricious is a bit more straightforward. It's the absence of a rational connection between the facts found and the choices made. It's a legal term. It basically means that the agency made a clear error in judgment, or, you know, the classic term is mistakes were made. There was no rational connection between the facts and the choices that the agency made. This is a situation where someone has, again, uh, litigated against the NRCS or the FSA or the USDA as a whole. What the judge does is they assign one of their minions to look at the policy of the particular agency in question and the, and they say, OK, did they follow their internal policy? And usually this is where we get nailed in a lawsuit. So this doesn't even get to the level of the judge. This is basically one of their clerks reads NRCS policy and then sees whether or not NRCS has actually followed its own policy. This is not a question of the regulation, not a question of the law. It's just whether or not you have done what your agency said it was going to do. So arbitrary and capricious considered a clear error of judgment. Uh, this happened Well, I was in the age. It's happened several times. It happens repeatedly. I mean, quite often this is where any lawsuit ends when it's being done against USDA. It's almost always with an arbitrary and capricious ruling. So back in 2008, USDA wanted to open up land that was in CRP because there was a large drought in the southeastern United States. So they wanted to be allow uh, people to be able to uh, bring their cattle or, you know, their livestock and allow them to forage on CRP acreage. So USDA say this is a great idea. This is helpful for the farmers, helpful for cattle ranchers. This is a uh, extreme situation in the southeast. We're going to do it. Well, the National Wildlife, Wildlife Federation sued claiming that in this case, since it was CRP, the Farm Services Agency violated NEPA in that it acted arbitrarily and capriciously and not in accordance with the law. And I remember when this came out, Barry Fisher was still working for the agency. He used to have his uh, cubicle read right across from me. And I, I remember because people think I'm some kind of legal expert because I'm an archeologist, what's gonna happen? And my response is, we're gonna lose. 
And he said, why? And my answer was because we got sued. And that sounds a little cynical, but National Wildlife Federation at all. So this is a, a mainstream uh, environmental organization that is very supportive of CRP. But within CRP, there are various uh, things that you're doing and wildlife is part of CRP. It's, pa it's part of why we put things in the CRP and there are rules about uh, wildlife within it. So at the time, our Secretary of Ag was a man named Schaefer, I forget his first name, uh, political appointee, no real background in Ag, which I don't really hold against them. The really reason I really kind of remember the guy is he made his money by selling Mr. Bubble, where if you're as old as I am, if you're in the late 60s, early 70s, this is what he gave you a kid for a bubble bath. So National Wildlife Federation had prepared environmental studies because when you're suing, you know, the agency, uh, you have to come up with, OK, what is being harmed? You got a study that says if you open this up to cattle raising, you're going to be harming certain wildlife that you shouldn't be doing with you to have in CRP. And they they had it, the study done already because they were going to challenge the FSA analysis. Turns out that was totally unnecessary because there had been no FSA analysis. In essence, it was a political decision based on these are our clients, we're going to open it up to help our clients, but it totally ignored the fact that there were special environmental concerns embedded in the CPA 52 that you did for CRP, that you couldn't do it. So the judge immediately just issued a restraining order. I mean, this probably took all of 15 minutes said the USDA environmental analysis was a joke and described the USDA's, USDA's actions as a breathtaking. And this guy is a, was a Reagan appointee. You know, conservative judge, it doesn't matter. If you're not following your own policy, it's a slam dunk. You don't get to stage two where they actually see whether or not you're matching the regulations. You haven't even followed your internal policy. Now, fortunately, it was the National Wildlife Federation who fully supports CRP. So nobody shut down CRP because of this, because they were perfectly willing to negotiate to, that you've got to do the environmental study. You have to see what you're impacting. So what you have to remember about compliance is the process is what is legally required. Uh, it sounds funny, but it's not the result. You do consultation, you do the impact studies. If necessary, you do an environmental impact statement. In the end, if you provide reason why, you can negatively impact the environment in historic sites if you go through the process and you supply a rationale as to why the project is worth the negative impact. In this case, drought relief for farmers. And this is true in ordinary circumstances. On the other hand, if you got a T&E species there that needs to be protected, or you got an historic site on the National Historic Register, you wouldn't be able to proceed with it. But that's the point, though. It is the process that is required. And about five years after this, they did the same thing, in which they wanted to open up CRP acreage again for a drought. But this time, they did the they did this impact study and they presented it to the various partners and they were able to proceed with this without being sued and without you know running the risk of you know shutting down the entire program so any questions at this point because brianne gets to do the fun part now because i've gone through my civics lesson so we're going to take just a five minute break in order for Brianne to shift over to her computer. And uh, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we're probably not going to take the full five minute break. Well, just wanted to make sure we build in some time in here to transfer who was speaking. So we're just going to go ahead and go on from here. And we know that this is not necessarily the most exciting topics that we have out there. Of course, we're all in this for the conservation side of it. And unless you are incredibly excited about the policy and legal aspects, this part can be dry. But it is, as Stephen said, building up to what many of our later presentations are going to include on the special environmental concerns, which I promise we'll be able to have a lot more pictures and, and the good stuff for those those particular presentations. But we need to build this framework as to why the policy matters, why the legal framework and, and these foundations do matter. And, and we've touched upon that. We're going to dive into it more from the um, specifically from the the policy side as it deals with the CPA 52 and our environmental evaluation. So why does this all matter? For the exact reason we do everything. It is planning. All of our resource concerns, the SWAPA plus human plus energy resource concerns are required by the planning policy. Special environmental concerns are required by various laws, regulations, or executive orders. So everything we do is linked to this concept of law, regulation, and policy that Stephen has gone over. So we can take a look at the pyramid again, and this time it is filled in with the National Environmental Policy Act. And you can see from that foundation of the law, it moves up again through the regulations into our own interpretation of that into our general manual and handbook. So it is a layered approach every time. Very foundational at the bottom, that's the base of that pyramid up to the policy. And we'll dive into why there's two sets of regulation in the case of this law here in a few slides. But again, we we need to know that this is that foundation. And of course, the, the base being what will ultimately be, re be reviewed at each of these levels, if, if there would ever be a question, is that law. And then determining, did the regulation follow the law? Did the policy follow the law? Do our handbooks follow policy? All of those things fall within the pyramid. So we get to NEPA, our favorite. And NEPA as an environmental policy is an umbrella legislation. It requires federal agencies to follow certain procedures for their actions and covers a broad range of other environmental laws. So as Stephen alluded to in some previous slides, it is a procedural act, meaning it only requires that certain procedures be followed, but does not dictate any particular result or outcome. The act requires an evaluation of the environmental impacts of proposed actions and alternatives and public involvement, documentation of that analysis and the results to inform decisions. So it was signed into law by President Nixon in 1970 and resulted in four major outcomes. It declared a national policy to protect the environment. It created the Council on Environmental Quality, the CEQ, which is appointed by the president to oversee federal agencies' compliance with the act. It required that each federal agency develop the regulations to implement the act. NRCS's regulations are in 7 CFR 650, and this is the reason why there were two sets of regulations in that previous pyramid. We have those that are established by the Council of Environmental Quality and then our own as an agency. And then it required that federal agencies provide a detailed statement of environmental impacts for major federal actions significantly affecting the environment. So this is when we get into the joy of all the legalese that come with it, including this highlighted phrase, major federal actions significantly affecting the environment. What exactly does that mean and how does that apply to us? Note that NEPA only applies to federal actions. So let's break this down into what exactly is a federal action. A federal action equals federal control or responsibility. Anytime NRCS has federal control or responsibility, it is a federal action. This most obviously includes instances of financial assistance or the FA side of what we do but it in could include items we are not contributing financial assistance to, such as 
when we decide whether a pipeline may cross a WRE easement. Although we are not contributing funds, we have control over the outcome of that action. Providing technical assistance only is not a federal action because NRCS does not have control over whether the technical advice is implemented or control over the standards of implementation. And we are only talking in this instance about NEPA as the, the law. So we'll get into why we look at these, why we continue to do a CPA 52 for technical assistance in a few slides. But for this instance, when we're talking about the law itself, NRCS does not have control over the action, so technical advice is not part of the law. So next quiz, and you can place your selections in the chat. Which of the following on the screen are federal actions? Type in your multiple choice selections. Okay, well, we had a lot of all of the aboves, but on the screen now, the green yeses are the actual federal actions. So let's walk through these um, one by one to understand why some of these are actually a no. So B, C, and E are yeses. Certifying an NRCS standard for a state cost share program is not a federal action per NEPA because we don't have control of the outcome. We can tell the state if we're working with our partners on say a layer project where they are using something for NRCS standards. We can tell them and, and provide our input on whether or not the implementation of the practice did in fact meet our standards, but what the state does with that information is up to them. We don't control the outcome. We don't decide if they're gonna pay on it. We don't decide if they're gonna decertify it. We're just providing that technical assistance. And again, we're talking about this from the NEPA side of things. Obviously, we went over, um, we're granting a WRP compatible use. That is a yes, because we do control the outcome. We can tell the landowner whether they can and cannot do the practice and how they can do it. We discussed in the previous slide that FA payments are a federal action. Making an HEL or wetland compliance determination is not a federal action. It is actually us providing a technical determination. And from NEPA standpoint, we provide that information to the landowner, but what they do with it is up to them. They may still proceed with whatever action they were gonna take. They may change their mind. It is up to them. We don't control that. So it is not a federal action according to NEPA. Subordinating a WRP easement for a pipeline, that example I covered previously, and then determination of FSA 1985 approved system falls under that same category as the HEL wetland compliance determination above. Again, it's us providing that guidance, but not deciding what the outcome will be. So when we talk about federal actions, the next step in the process is determining whether or not it's a major federal action. And the term major is defined by the Council of Environmental Quality Regulations stating that major reinforces but does not have meaning independent from significantly. This is again getting into that fun legalese that is out there. But really it comes down to a couple of different factors that you'll be looking at. One, do we have federal control over or responsibility, basically tying back to the previous slide, and do the actions significantly affect the environment? That makes it a major federal action. And then there's a whole list of how can we decide if it was significantly affecting the environment. And as outlined by the Council of Environmental Quality, you need to look at if it's significant based on two considerations. One is the context, the location, the community, the watershed, the region you're in, and then the intensity. 
And you'll notice in the list on intensity, many of our special environmental concerns fall in here, cultural resources, prime farmlands, threatened and endangered species. And of course, some very obvious things such as, are we going to be violating federal or state or local laws? So this is where we're not only looking, what do we have control over, but then how impactful is it going to be on the surrounding environment and the community? So here's an example, excuse me, of what of language that we would want to find on a CPA 52 or in a case file. So really what this comes down to is we know the CPA 52 doesn't have a lot of space. So you may have to document some of this information in the um, in your technical assistance notes, but def definitely reference those notes on the CPA 52. And as you're doing this documentation, you are going to be documenting how significant the action is. So let's take the example of expanding a spillover or spillway. You have gone out on the site and determined that there is the need to widen an emergency spillway, but that it, you document that it's going to adversely affect wildlife. When we're doing this determination of significance, we're gonna need more information than that. That is not enough context for us to be able to go back to the 52 or if there would ever be one of these procedural looks at the 52 or why maybe we didn't provide cost share or there was appeal. This does not provide enough detail to, to let us know, did we have a significant effect? Just saying widening an emergency spillway will adversely affect wildlife certainly doesn't provide me enough information but it will not provide anyone that goes back to review it. So when you're in a situation like this, it is important to fill in more details. So you would want your assistance notes, or if you can somehow manage to fit it into the 52 box, which is, is pretty tiny, um, document what you're going to do, that you're widening a spillway from 120 feet to 186 feet, and this will result in the loss of 10 out of 15 of the last remaining loose bark trees in this riparian area. These clusters are known to provide maternal roosting sites for the endangered Indiana bat. So in this case, we have more detail. We know that there is the potential to affect an endangered species, the maternal roosting areas for these cute little bats that like to, to roost with their, their young under the bark. And we're now identifying the intensity factors. We're identifying the unique characteristics of this geographic area, such as the fact it is a riparian area, it does have these loose bark trees, that there are endangered species, that we know that the teeny records show a maternal roost colony in the area. So now we're falling under the Endangered Species Act. And that the fact that we would be losing a significant number of these, these trees here. Now, one of the keys to the NEPA is it's going to be your judgment. It is up to the federal agent that is working on this to, to show what this intensity is and to provide that accurate documentation. It is also possible, as we know, and we're going to go forward with it in the next slides, to find ways to avoid it. If we have to go forward with this and do, and do this activity at this time, there could be a major impact, but as you know, there's ways that we can avoid it. And so I hear there's a question. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, Karen, you're still muted. If you uh, want to have a question, your hand is up. Karen, if you can just type your question into the chat, we'll um, get that answered as soon as we can. So from the previous slide, now that we've identified that there is the potential for a significant um, determination, what are our options? That doesn't necessarily, and hopefully you realize now in, in regards to the Indiana bat, this doesn't necessarily put a stop to the project, correct? We have options out there. And the way we can look at this is by using an early scoping phase for any proposed action. We can look and see what does the activity 
going to do and how and what options do we have out there to address it? And some of those ways we can do that are either using these categorical exclusions, we'll go into those next, and in, an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. Each one of these is a progression in the level of detail that we would need to document. First, we should look at whether the action can be categorically excluded from a detailed review under NEPA. This is your number one option. Categorical exclusions are a category of actions that NRCS has demonstrated do not individually or cumulatively have significant effect on environment. This is the way we want to go. If an action is listed as being categorically excluded, NRCS still must determine whether there are other circumstances. Every site's unique, as we know. So there may be other circumstances out there that preclude our using these, but since we have adopted this significance criteria and it, use it for the categorical exclusions and all of our practices have been reviewed under these, this is really one of our better options. If an action fits in this category, this is where we'll go. And we're gonna get into the individual categorical exclusions, how to use them, how to document them on the CPA 52 in our third session in two weeks from now. But again, this is the, the way and the route that we want to use because again, everything, most of our practices, all of our programs have been evaluated under some sort of document at a national level that allows us to use these in many ways. And the reason we want to go this way is because if an action cannot be categorically excluded, then we are going to the next level of detail. Examples of categorical exclusions are planting the appropriate herbaceous woody vegetation, plugging or filling an excavated drainage ditch, so those actions we take in a restoration process, implementing soil control measures on existing agricultural lands. So hopefully you can see just in this very limited listing of examples, these are things that we typically do on our day-to-day -day jobs. This is the things we do through our programs. And ultimately we have this firm basis for how to categorically exclude these and, and document it on the CPA 52. If that doesn't work, if you, if you get into a situation where there is likely to be some additional impact or that we're going to do uh, an action that cannot be excluded, the next level of the assessment is the environmental analysis or environmental assessment. This is a concise public document for which a federal agency is that is responsible for just serves to briefly provide sufficient evidence and analysis for determining whether to prepare an impact statement or whether or not we can say there's a finding of no significant impact. Now, although this definition uses the term briefly, having participated in some environmental analysis assessments and analyses before, I can tell you they are not brief. They are multiple pages. They are simply more brief than an environmental impact statement. So this will require consultation with the public, with our partners, doing a more detailed analysis of what our action would take on the environment, and is not just a few pages of documentation that we have available to us now with the CPA 52. Environmental assessments are a more detailed next step, and we, again, would like to use categorical exclusions when at all possible. If the environmental assessment does determine that there's a finding of no significant impact, we can use that documentation as okay and move on. We don't do this often. We really don't do it within the state as an agency very often, but that option is there. Now, if you are taking some actions or planning some practices that meet this need for an assessment, and then we do find there is significant impact, the next phase and the next complexity that comes with this is the environmental impact statement. And according to NRCS regulations, there are four situations where we will always do an environmental impact statement. And this will not impact you or will unlikely impact you. This is going to be elevated to either the state office or even to a regional office, depending on what the project is. But this is for stream channel realignment with significant aquatic or wildlife habitat um, impl implications there. Congressional actions, those don't happen very often anymore that require these impact statements. That was more tied with our watershed projects and dams. 
significant cumulative effects. So if we start doing practices that are going to pile on top of each other additional environmental concerns, we've got a cultural resource impact, we've got a t and &E impact, we've got an environmental justice impact, one on top of the other, then that becomes cumulatively a very significant action and we would need to do a bigger assessment or impact statement. And then there are other major federal actions that could significantly affect the environment. Again, we don't do this very often because we are fortunate enough to have the categorical exclusions. And to emphasize again why the CPA 52 is important, environmental impact stakes Mints are large. They're substantial documents. They are hundreds of pages long. They are multiple volumes long. So anything we do where we can find alternatives that meet the criteria of categorical exclusions as well as the low significance is the preferable way to go. And since most of what we do follows that line and we're following the practice standards, it's and is entirely linked to our conservation practices or programmatic actions. That's probably the situation you are going to find yourself in 99.9% .9 of the time. But you need to know what these next steps are and you need to know how complicated it, it, it gets, especially if we get into this environmental impact st stage of the process. So with all of this information, if we determine that there is not a major federal action, you might be asking yourself, well, why do we even need to fill out the CPA 52? And NEPA doesn't even apply to our resource concerns. Well, while NEPA may not cover our resource concerns, NRCS planning policy does. The environmental evaluation or our CPA 52 is the part of the planning that inventories and estimates the potential effects on the human environment of the alternatives and solutions to resource problems. The NRCS regulations also state the environmental evaluation process is an essential part of planning and applies to all NRCS assistance. So note this is the difference between NEPA and our planning policy. And that's why we need to do the 52, even if we're doing technical assistance. Prior to 2010, there was no written directive that the CPA 52 form be used, but it was recommended. And then a national instruction was issued. So again, looking at policy was issued in 2010 that requires all states use the national CPA 52 for planning. So just taking a quick moment here to see if there's any questions from the NEPA side before we jump into the planning side. We, again, we know this is not necessarily the most exciting topic, but this does get us into why the special environmental concerns re are required and things that we need to look at. All right. Okay, and we will we'll dive into that as we talk about this. So if I don't answer that as we dive into the planning part of this, we'll get into it um, after we go over the 52. So that's a great question and an important question to have. And Maggie Sullivan is interested in whether or not you come back to the bat habitat case study. It, Maggie, do you have a specific question related to that? You can unmute Maggie. Type it into the chat as well. Did the bat study that is a good question and follow up, and we'll be getting into that more with the T and E side of things. But I will um, just allude to when you have that finding of significance, that's when we will look at some things like mitigation options, and we're going to get into that here in a few slides. Um, Great, great prelude to that. But ultimately, if you're familiar with our BAT guidance, the BAT dates are a way that we can move away from a finding of significant impact because we are outside the maternal nesting, or not nesting, but maternal um, roosting dates. Great question. So normally, policy is found in our manuals, including the general manual, and the handbooks contain the how-to on how to implement the policy. In the case of planning policy, the handbook and the general manual are so intertwined that they actually really function as one. So anytime that there's a question, both are taken into consideration in, in this instance, just because of how often the planning procedures handbook is referenced in terms of our planning policy. 
So now we're, we've, we've stepped out of that law framework and now we're getting into that, that policy side of things. Federal law does require NRCS planners to consider the environmental consequences of recommended actions and to provide decision makers information on the actions that might significantly affect the human environment. So part of that is that NRCS requ is required to conduct the environmental evaluation, again the CPA 52 is the document we use for that, for all planning and financial assistance. Remember, the significance criteria we talked about earlier are also used within the environmental evaluation process to help assess the level of environmental impact of actions and whether there are extraordinary circumstances that preclude the use of categorical exclusions. And again, while we know the CPA 52 is just one more form and step that needs to be completed, please keep in mind what we just talked about. Without this document to assess significance, in the link to the categorical exclusions and evaluations, we would be doing an environmental assessment or impact statement for so many of the things we do. So here's the, the conservation planning process again, and we're all familiar with this. So again, how do you determine which resource concerns are relevant? Where does this fall in the nine step planning process? This is really a, a process of that scoping, that planning steps, the inventory, and inventory of the resources and planning step four, that analyzing the resources. As we look at our conservation planning, we see that there are a multitude of potential resource concerns to choose from. Some are pertinent, some are not. The SWAPA plus H plus E resource concerns are required by our policy. The special environmental concerns are required by law. Scoping is the process that helps us ensure that the real problems are identified early and properly decided upon and that the issues are of no concern so that we don't spend too much time or effort on, cons on these irrelevant concerns, but really focus on those that are important to our planning process. Scoping initially occurs in planning steps three and four, but may continue throughout the planning process. And so here are an example of three resource concerns and how they were scoped. As you look through it, there is cultural resources. We look and see, are they out there? Again, we'll get into that, each of these in more detail as we go through the individual special environmental concerns over the next couple of weeks. We're looking at that range. So again, looking at the look locality that how far is this impact going to be, the benchmark conditions that are out there, and is it relevant to what we're going to do? If in the case of cultural resources, you may find on the CPA 52 tool that there are cultural resources in your planning land unit, but then when we look at the action that you're going to do, we will actually not be affecting that area or that target. Stephen always helps with that determination. If there is a practice being planned that doesn't result in an undertaking, then there's no impact. So we can document it as no effect and move on. For something like migratory birds, if there's a potential impact such as a prescribed burn scheduled outside the nesting period, that is a potential issue. And that is why we have those nesting dates in, in programs such as CRP and, and try to follow those through all our programs because that's a mitigation process. That allows us to do an action that would be outside when we're going to have the greatest effect on it. And this goes back to that the bat situation. If we had trees that needed to be removed in order to expand the spillway, we would be able to do that outside the roosting period. So for us, that, that falls into the winter months when the bats are in their hibernacula. Cutting down the trees at that time is not li likely to result in the take of a bat. And then there are other special environmental concerns that we look at as well in the back. And we're going to get into each of these in, in much more detail over the next couple of weeks. So really through that planning process, we're going to determine what resource concerns as well as special environmental concerns are out there. What is their range? What is the potential impact of our actions? and then determine, is it going to be a relevant or is it not? And if it's not, then it's not a significant impact. Again, mitigation is a technique employed when an undesirable effect of an action is present and is used to abate those effects. It's usually a sequence process that that we can be that can be familiarly related to a practice we should all be familiar with, which is pest management. And so can anyone tell me or type into the chat what this acronym from our pest management practice stands for?
crickets so far. <laughs> From the Integrative Pest Management, what do these, this acronym Mike, stand for? Mike Hughes says Pesticide Something Management System. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my attempt to tie the legalese back to, to our practices uh, did not resonate. But for PAMS, we talk about prevention. Our Avo Cambrin has prevention, avoidance, monitoring, and suppression. Yes, there we go, there we go. <laughs> so we do have the prevention and avoidance. In this case, we're going to talk about minimizing when we talk about this with our special environmental concerns. So either prevent the impact on the concern, avoid the concern altogether. If we can't minimize it, or ultimately the, the answer might be stop. That's not exactly straight up with the um, pest management side of things, but at least hopefully that ties it into what we're trying to do with that 52. Why, when you send things in to Stephen and I, we're going to provide some guidance into, well, if you change the practice implementation procedures in this way, then we are getting to that prevention or avoiding. If we cut down trees outside the best bat roosting season, then we're avoiding impact on the bat. If we are burning outside the nesting dates, we're avoiding the impact on the nesting or minimizing it. Sometimes birds do nest outside those dates, but it, we're really minimizing it. And if we know that there is absolutely no way that we can prevent, avoid, or minimize our impact to these special environmental concerns, then the answer ultimately may be stop. And sometimes that is okay, the case. So let's dive into the actual CPA 52. Indiana Bulletin 180, 2006 from last year was issued to bring updates to the CPA 52 that became available in fiscal year 2020. A more detailed webinar was offered after its issuance and I encourage you to go listen to that webinar. It was recorded. We're just going to touch on some highlights here that really lead into our next couple weeks of discussion. For NRCS and partner staff with SharePoint Access, the document can be located from the homepage. We recently had the document locked down a little more, so you do need to download it to your machine. So always periodically check back for updates, but that way we cannot um, save our changes to the statewide option. So if you haven't downloaded it recently or if you've had some bad luck with downloads in the past, I encourage you to go back and take a look at it again. From a general policy standpoint, these items haven't changed with the updated guidance, but are reminders of current policy that were restated with that bulletin release last year and associated with policy and guidance. Basically, any funded activity or where we've provided technical assistance or that is logged as a practice in NPAD should be assessed on the CPA 52. Even if a section is populated with not applicable, that's okay as long as that resource concern is not applicable. Please don't leave anything blank. So we, we don't want to necessarily have anything blank. Again, this is policy. We are supposed to be assessing all of these. There are laws, again, that require us to assess these. So make sure that you're documenting in each of the sections whether we've addressed or assessed that resource concern or the special environmental concerns. And you can go ahead and reference the other tools and case file documents, as I stated earlier in the instance of the, the BAT issue. This form is very small. Good luck um, if you tried to fit everything into those blocks, it, it would be very difficult to read. So it is okay to reference the documentation in the CPA 52 tool, for instance, if when you run that. Um, if you have other assistance notes, go ahead and document those there. It is just, again, that overarching procedural document that how we document these things, and then they can reference other tools and resources we have out there. The form update did include the new resource concerns. Those are in the drop down, and this was updated to match the national terminology. And it was also to update the resource concerns that were you can now find in CART. So these updates are out there. So again, hopefully everyone's using the new CPA 52 tool, but if you haven't, definitely get on SharePoint and download the more recent one. And recalling back to Jennifer's presentation on the field office technical guide, if you have curiosity about the resource concerns, definitely take a look under section three. 
There uh, is a detailed list of PDFs on the individual resource concerns, the updated resource concerns that were released. And this is a great way to talk with your landowners and some of our newer employees on what is out there. These are short single page information sheets for each one. The special environmental concerns are no different than our resource concerns. Again, they do need to be completed. Planners should be sure to review each of these and either if any of them are labeled as not evaluated, convert those either into a not applicable because the special environmental concern is not there or to a no effect if it is there, but we know that the action will have no effect on it. Not applicable does mean it is not there. An example in Indiana that where it should be universally not applicable would be coral reefs. There are no coral reefs. Believe it or not, there are parts of the state that actually do have coastal zone management, those that are in contact with the Great Lakes. So in that case, there's a very limited range where there that might actually be applicable and it would be more appropriate to write no effect if nothing we're doing is going to impact those coastal management zones. So no effect and not applicable are not interchangeable and it is important on the 52 to document appropriately. If there are any concerns that you do not know whether or not there are going to be an effect, most often I can think of the cultural resources or the threatened and endangered species, then that is where it is appropriate to begin to elevate those. If you cannot determine from the output of the tool whether or not you will have an effect on these, please feel free to elevate that issue up through the area specialists or up to Stephen and I, and we will help with that determination. And really going back to this, if you compare the requirements of the environmental evaluation with the steps of the planning process, what do you find? The environmental evaluation does cover planning steps one through seven. Though the terminology may differ slightly, they're essentially the same. Documentation of planning outcomes satisfi satisfies the needs of the environmental evaluation and vice versa. If you do a thorough job of one, you'll automatically do a thorough job of the other. It's, it's not a separate process. So hopefully this is a good encouragement to, to use that CPA 52 tool for the planning process, not only so that we cover our basis from the policy and the legal and, and regulation side of things, but also from the process of getting good conservation on the ground. In summary, the environmental evaluation is documentation of the planning process. There are additional benefits to you as the planner, the agency, and our customers after completing these, this process. Once the environmental evaluation and planning process is completed, the conservation planner has a comprehensive comparison of the impacts of potential alternatives, both positive and negative, on the resource concerns and knowledge about any permits the landowner may need, information about other issues that may require consultation with other agencies, such as cultural resources or endangered and threatened species, and in sharing this information with the landowner, the planner helps the landowner make this as an informed decision. Everyone will know what is needed up front. And although with something like technical assistance where we may not control the outcome, if the landowner is aware that there are potential threatened and endangered species or they're all cultural resources, then they can take the next steps to determine what they need to do from the legal and regulatory side of things. Just a reminder, today we went through the laws, regulations, and policy, how we go through those to decide what is an important resource concern to address, which ones are significant federal action versus major federal action, our regulations, policy, and guidance, and the CPA 52, and how that ties back to the regulations and policy and guidance. And if you're really excited about this topic, there are obviously the general manual, the National Environmental Compliance Handbook, and the National Planning Procedures Handbook, all that answer this in far more detail. This week's gonna be a little bit of a shorter presentation. I'm sure you're all disappointed by that. But as we dive into the special environmental concerns over the next two weeks, we're gonna really get into how you make these significant determinations for each of those as along the way. But we wanted to provide this baseline framework up front so we all know where those laws and regulations are coming from and why we need to consider them. With that, does anyone have any questions? And Jennifer did put the link to the CPA 52 recorded training session in the chat. 
for those who haven't caught it, that's a great update and a more thorough covering of the CPA 52 itself. Al Tinsley has his hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, as the other major source of bringing down regulation activities on everybody's head, I just wanted to point out that there's a whole different aspect to this and that is when Congress starts the ball rolling with their legislation, they're not really giving any thought to uh, workload down at the field level. So I know when we get something that's relatively new at the state office that we know we're gonna have to pass on in the form of policy and guidance is, is what can we do to lessen the uh, workload on the field offices, but sometimes um, everybody's constrained by the way Congress passed the law that there's not much we can do. But what it does mean is um, we do want you to be working with um, your supervisors and your your program specialist as to how things are impacting your work and areas where you see things could be uh, changed or shortened or made more efficient so that um, we can take those recommendations and uh, see if we can implement them, you know, as much as possible. I know that's something that uh, we're always trying to do. So uh, make sure that uh, you've got good relationships with your supervisors and you're keeping them in the specialist apprised of uh, how things are going. So we're, we are actually very interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, Al. So just a reminder, today's session we have the three weeks coming up again, as Stephen mentioned, to cover sessions one through 11 of the environmental evaluation webinar series, which is part of the certified planner documentation process. This session today actually covered environmental webinar series number one, as well as environmental series number two, and we will be getting into three through 11 in a combined format over the next two weeks, which dives into each of the special environmental concerns and then a individual topic of the categorical exclusion. So we're going to dive in more into the day to day applicability of these topics. But today we were just providing this foundational um, portion of this. So those who are in attendance today and who have watched this will get credits for number one and number two. We'll give one more moment for another set of questions. Are there any out there? Nope, just a series of thank yous and we're going back to work. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Well, thank you everyone. We'll dive in again next week into some of the environmental concerns. And I promise you when we get out of the law side of things, we can actually put pictures on the screen. So it'll be at least visually more entertaining. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Good morning.